Hello friends. There we go. We have we have a little bit. Let me turn down my monitor here. Welcome. Happy uh, third day of summer to you. <laughs> my name's Dan and this is Daily Art Adventure number 922 transitioning to oil on a city skyline. Whew. I love my new clapper by the way. Thanks Ray. If you happen to see yesterday's broadcast then uh, you might have seen me oh no two days ago I'm sorry two days ago I started this in acrylics. Every painting every painting I do and of course I've, I've done thousands, literally thousands of paintings. And every painting is a little bit of a new adventure. Every day, every morning when I get up and, and grab a paintbrush, I'm a slight a slightly different person than I was the day before. Therefore, every, even though, like most of you, I, I have my routines, I have, you know, my ABC one, two, three that I do in the course of producing a painting. But even with that, if you will, tried and true routine, there's still wide area for experimentation. Just being in a different mood and being a different person, having a hard time getting my Facebook. It was it was uh, it was doing just fine until right before I started broadcasting. I'm not going to fight with it too long. I would love to have my Facebook friends joining us, but I'm not going to uh, fight with the technology so much that I lose my uh, YouTube friends. So maybe just one more try. I do have a, a shopping list, if you will. Okay, that's it. So, so, so sad was all ready to go with the Facebook and uh, now now the technology has bailed on me and it is it's not user error <laughs> it sounds defensive doesn't it um, I've got a shopping list of um, better technology that I, I need to buy so that I can broadcast on two channels at the same time. All right, so everything that was on this canvas a few minutes ago was, of course, acrylic. And right now I'm doing a, a glaze is always one of my favorite parts of the painting process. Of course, happiness is, as an artist, is having, is feeling like every phase <laughs> of the painting process is your favorite. And that's a pretty close description of how I feel most of the time. I'm using Liquin. Let me show you the bottle here for any newcomers. Hello, Ade. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Uncle, I need my 14-year-old to do my tech. I wish that were it. Uncle, you know, you actually, you know exactly what, what's going on here. I'm trying to use my old Mevo camera to uh, broadcast on um, Facebook. And, and you, you remember the 
problems we had with the old one. So I'm looking forward. They've actually up. They've actually improved uh, the Amiibo product in the last. Looks to me like six or eight months, and I'm going to buy their latest and greatest camera, and then things will be much better, I suspect. But I have to pay my taxes first. <laughs> A little, little dose of reality right in the midst of my broadcasting ambitions. Oh, wait, <laughs> before I buy a camera. Uh, um, <laughs> have to pay my 2019 tax. It's a strange, strange situation. I usually pay them throughout, you know, throughout the year quarterly, but last year I didn't. So I, I've got a whopping bill. Things could be worse. It would be worse if I had made no money last year so I wouldn't owe any taxes. Now that would be worse, wouldn't it? Worser? -er? <laughs> Again, just in case anybody's watching who's new, um, well, let me show you my, I'll show you my, uh, my, hang on, get my furniture rearranged. There's my palette, glass palette with a brown back behind it. My colors, my, a pile of liquid. So I typically dip my brushes heavily, if you will, in the liquid and then just tap them in whatever color I uh, then want to. So it's, uh, I would guess the mixture on my brushes would be roughly 80% um, liquid and 20% 20 paint. I find that many early journey painters, um, especially, well, if, 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 if early journey or traditional painters, first, but I intentionally say the 20th. Traditional 20th century painting is opaque straight out of the tube. Nothing wrong with that except that painting in the traditional manner, <laughs> and now I'm by traditional, I mean the last 500 years, painting in traditional manner, which is layers of transparent glazes, is superior in my opinion. To, uh, the, the opaque. Anyway, so if you're new to glazing, uh, I find the early journey people who are new to my technique have a hard time. The, the, their default setting is 80% paint and 20% medium. Again, they're going back to their perhaps they're going back to uh, you know, the way my daddy painted. <laughs> with uh, linseed oil. You add a little bit of linseed oil to your paint. So th th I think that's where that impulse comes from, sort of that mid 20th century impulse uh, or, or practice of a medium is a little tiny bit of this or that that you add to your paints. Anyway, so my point being, um, it's way much medium, little much paint. A lot more medium than paint. A lot of medium, not much paint. There we go. Okay, I said it three different ways just to lots and lots and lots and lots of medium. Same thing to acrylics, by the way, roughly 80 20 or something like that. Depending, you can't make a real rule out of it, the numbers, because much of it depends on which medium and which paint and which, which qual what quality you're using. Okay, I'm going to do, have to do a little bit more up here in the sky. I want to do a little bit of blue. Then I'll be done with the glazing. Now, I'm going to try not to go terribly long. I know my broadcasts, I just drone on forever. <laughs> Speaking of droning on forever, I, I don't want to make a big deal of this, but I went to bed, uh, well, two days ago I broadcast 
and as I as as my voice as my broadcast echoed in my mind, I became more and more and more uncomfortable with s several things that I said in my last broadcast. You don't have to go back and listen to it. Please don't. Um, I'll just say that in a word, I got for no good reason. I have no good reason other than my own broken <laughs> uh, brokenness and issues. I got defensive, self-defensive. <laughs> To against, against the voice in my head, I, I wasn't arguing with any of you. I was arguing. Well, I was arguing with some trolls, of course. But if you're online, you have trolls. Just shouldn't have, shouldn't have gone down that road. So anyway, don't listen to that. <laughs> and I apologize for this getting off track in my broadcast number 921. So I'm going to try to make a fresh resolution. <coughs> no more, no more defensive, defensive attitude for me. Just speak what I think is true and let the chips fall where they may. Um, oh, a little, uh, um, I just had to think long enough to say the word um, and I realized, oh wait, 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 there's a little bit more color here, a little bit that I want to do, and that is some really pretty purple, purple violet stuff over here. Again, I'm looking at my photo reference, there's my, my photo reference is up there. And uh, I did not take that picture. <clears throat> my client, this is a commission piece. My client provided me with the photograph. It is clearly a professional photograph, which means there are clearly uh, copyright issues <laughs> associated with uh, copying someone else's photograph. The general rule is if, if the, if the original photographer were able to point at my painting and say, Hey, that's my photograph. Then, then I've copied it too carefully. Generally speaking, because of my, so I'm giving this advice to you as well. And it may be worth no more than what it's worth for work in your painting, then you violated copyright. Because of my looseness of my renderings, I think, I think the photographer could look at it and say, hey, I took a picture a lot like that one time. But I think that's about as far as it, it would go. Hey, Avi. <coughs> I'm the I'm the babysitter at home here for a little while today, by the way. So if if I suddenly have to zoom off to take care of some crisis, that's why all the other adults in the house are gone. I've got four kids with me here, but they're great kids, but they're real kids, so you never know. All right. The glaze is done. Woohoo! What? Wait, wait. <laughs> no, the glaze is done. Um, again, just a quick glance at the at the photograph up there. Um, I'm, I'm adhering, you know, fairly carefully. It's a fairly careful drawing, even though I, as you know, I did it step by step. This is how many layers is that? Not counting the glaze, I just did uh, probably eight or nine maybe even 10 layers. So, you know, creeping up on accuracy little by little. I, am I back? Things are okay now, right, Uncle? <laughs> Hello, disconnecting. <laughs> Ah, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. It is a cool vista. 
<laughs> um, Uncle, you've got me worried. Lost feed, I'm like I said, I'm assuming we're back. Um, next stage, just a real quick, quick update. Um, for a number of years, when I got to this point right here, the next thing I did would do would be draw in either pencils or brushes. Drawing in pencils, as you know, is very unconventional. That's, that is not normal, but I do it anyway. Uh, but that's, I, at this point, I, normally I would draw. But in the last year or so, I have evolved slightly. And I believe I'm going to do that here today. I, I'm going to do the, the fuzz layer. The fuzz layer at this point. I'll define the fuzz layer. It is, first of all, very fuzzy edges, very soft edges, thus fuzz. Number two, it's very translucent, can see through it. Not transparent like glass, but translucent like wax paper, okay? Translucent. And third, local color. So if there's any part of the painting that I need to shift, uh, like I do in the sky, if there's any part of the painting that needs shifting, I do most of that right here. I could also call this the glow layer. That would be appropriate. Um, I could also call it the atmosphere layer. That would also be a, a fairly accurate description. In fact, I think that's actually where I'm going to start here today. I'm going to start um, in the sky, in the atmosphere, quote unquote. <laughs> Literally. All right, so now it's time for the first time to get out some uh, titanium white onto my palette. Bear with me just a minute while I clean up my palette. Scraping it with a razor. I don't need to show you this part, I don't think. I just need to make sure I've got enough area on my palette to mix some, some white paint. All right, and again, you old timers know this. The, the titanium white that I use is an alkyd or fast dry titanium white, okay? <coughs> That's because, first of all, titanium white is one, is a very slow drying color, first of all. Different colors dry at different rates. I don't know if you know that or not. Anyway, and uh, Secondly, if an artist is going to have any thick areas of paint called impasto or impasto, if an artist is going to create any impasto in his painting, her painting, it's almost certainly going to be in the light at the very end. The light paint will be applied thickly. And um, that would mean titanium. And uh, if you do titanium thick, it could take two months for that white, so that I don't have to worry. I can go ahead and put impasto down and not worry about it taking two months to dry, which I certainly cannot afford. Um, I'm trying to make a living as an artist. My paintings, uh, my neat paintings need to get done and out the door done out the door and get paid for and get the checks deposited in my checking account so I can pay my bills. That's what it's like to be a full-time artist. <laughs> and I'm certainly not complaining. All right, I have here a, a very warm orange-yellow and I'm, I'm doing the, the fuzz thing in the sky. So you're seeing, um, again, if you're, if you're new to my channel and you're watching me or haven't seen me very many times, I'm, I'm here, I'm demonstrating what I mean by 
soft edges. Okay, I'm painting the edge of the sky, like the edge of this building is right here, but the brush stroke goes an inch and a half, or sometimes two inches over the line. Does that make sense? So that's what I mean by soft edges. Really, really, really soft edges. Not just a little bit soft. <laughs> and that, that's, that's kind of important. All right, I'm gonna add some permanent rose to that color. I love permanent rose. Man, that is my, it is my favorite red color, permanent rose. I am indebted to my dear friend, Sonia Kane, fellow painter here in Raleigh, North Carolina. She made me aware of permanent rose, I don't know, probably about five or six years ago. I would guess maybe, maybe four. And uh, it, that's one of the benefits of, of meeting with other painters, especially on a regular basis. I hope you have a, a local group that you can meet with uh, and, and, uh, and uh, critique each other's work. I've been a part of such a group, I think for 13 years. Before that, I was part of a illustrators group from the early 90s to the mid 90s. Before that, I was a part of uh, the Dallas Society of Illustrators in Dallas, Texas. That's where I learned. That was the first peer review, if you will, peer art group that I belonged to was the Dallas Society of Illustrators. And I immediately, this is in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, and I immediately discovered the the advantages of having such a group. Anyway, so there you go. Sonia and I have been in this group together for, as I said, um, at least 12 years. And it's great fun with her. You know, we're have a very special friendship, all of the half dozen or so, or, or dozen of us that have been doing this for years. And uh, it's really fun to watch each other improve. It's really fun to be, to share art journeys. I'll give you a, a word of, what's the word, instruction or caution for what it's worth. Hello, Nancy. Oh. Okay, thank you, Nancy. The this, the feed seems fine. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you for letting me know. Um, I have heard when I talk to my fellow artists who don't live in this area, <coughs> a couple times, a couple times I've been told. <coughs> area but it just didn't work which was a great mystery to me it caused quite a bit of a head scratching on my part and I'll, I'll tell you having listened to some of their stories just for just to might help me instruct It, it seems that um, what can kill a group like this is, uh, is somebody who is a, who is a smarty pants, know-it-all, who wants to dominate the group, control the group, and tell other people, you know, a big shot, a self-appointed big shot. So um, if you are putting together a group like this, um, Number one, you might be the <laughs> <coughs> look in the mirror. 
you might be the self-appointed big shot. And if you are, don't start a group. If, if you're starting a group and you think you are not the one who has power control issues, you just want it, then you might consider who you invite, at least initially. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to get involved in your business, but be a little bit careful. Um, watch out for dominator types. It seems to me, from what I've heard, that's the one thing that can really uh, keep this from succeeding. So somehow, here in Raleigh, North Carolina, I think we've managed to avoid having a dominator, control freak, show off, know-it-all, whatever you want to call them, person, uh, ruin it. Of course, so we'll see. For what it's worth, I should probably add, I am, what's the word? Ostensibly, I am, I am considered the official leader of this group, I, I guess. Um, but I will tell you that my leadership is so subtle. <laughs> if a visitor came to our group any, any given month, I'm not. I'm not sure. They they wouldn't necessarily figure out that I'm the leader. Okay, and I like it that way just fine. I have no need to be in charge. But that might be part of the reason why we've never had any control freak issues. Because maybe I'm influencing more control, more inf not control. Maybe I'm exerting more influence than I than I'm aware of. I'm not aware of inf of exerting much influence at all. But maybe a little bit, just enough to keep the know-it-all smarty pants control freaks from ruining it. All right. By the way, you, one of the things, you, you notice, of course, that I paint with two hands, and I typically try to have two different shape brushes. I mean, a different shape brush in each hand. Uh, just for the sake of variety, I want, I want my, um, I want my two brushes to be making two different kinds of mark. Now I've got um, much paler yellow clouds, in other words, cloud color on my you know, professional photograph. Um, <coughs> sorry, still recovering from a uh, something something down my throat, literally, huh? Uh, last week, um, I bless which does not lead to a good painting composition. Usually not a good idea to have a perfectly, you know, airbrushed sky in a painting. So I, this sky, I just Googled. I, I, that's part of the, if you will, the sketch, high-tech sketch process that many of us do. Uh, these days a lot of sketching is done in fact this is this coming fall at art of the carolinas i don't know how many of you americans are familiar with aoc <laughs> the other aoc art of the carolinas not a political one art of the carolinas um sponsored by jerry's artorama the art distributing company um and this is, I don't know, we're somewhere between 15 and 20 years, I believe, this year coming up. And it's, a, it's great fun. Uh, anyway, I'm teaching four classes this year. And uh, to teach, um, one of the classes I'm going to teach is called um, Portraits, Portrait Painting for the Rest of Us. Where I'm actually going to teach, I'm actually going to do nothing but teach all the quote-unquote cheater methods that I employ in doing portraits. Now, of course, I'm trying in the last six months or so, I'm trying to stop fun, old-fashioned terminology. Uh, most of the great masters through history did, in fact, 
quote unquote cheat. They did use photomechanical means. So that's, that's the term I'm using instead now. mechanical tricks that one can employ to get to get portraits right and um, two things dawned on me and I it just I'm not talking this is not a commercial to try to make it come I'm just tell you what I'm going to one of the things I'm going to teach is number one if you would say you're a semi-serious painter so if you're completely not serious, you don't care, you don't, don't give a flip and rip about it, <laughs> you do one painting every year, then I'm not talking to you. So I'm just, 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 you, just, you just keep doing whatever you want. Um, but if you are a semi, at least a semi-serious painter, then number one, you absolutely must have a smartphone. Now, <laughs> some of you are going to hear me say that and say, what? What are you talking about? Not have a smartphone? Are you kidding me? Well, I'm not kidding you. Um, let me let me let me explain that a little bit. When I'm out in the world teaching art classes, live art classes, um, I think about at least fifty percent of my students are women over the age of. 60 because I'm over 60 you know so that used to be old-ish now it's not even old-ish at all um, and I would say a good 40% of my students are women or men I'm trying to think, be honest over the age of 70 maybe 30% but anyway a generous a generous percentage of my uh, students are what one would call older <laughs> I didn't want to say elderly I'll just say older and that segment of our population has been traditionally predictably understandably pretty slow about jumping on technology so, so to some of them even uh, even some of them some of them even a, so all I'm saying is if you're an if you're an artist over 70 and you would call yourself semi-serious, my dear, you must have a smartphone and use it. And I, I'm going to, you know, I, you use it in a dozen different ways. All right, number one. Number two, <laughs> if you're at least a semi-serious artist, at least semi-serious or more, um, here, here, and I'll catch more of you with this one, you must have Photoshop. Sorry, done deal. Stop, stop fighting it. Stop arguing. It's ten dollars a month. It's a, a subscription-based product entirely. Now it has been for the last ten years, probably. You can't even, which is really good because you used to have to fork out seven hundred bucks for a uh, for a for a, a, a Photoshop. So I like this new world a whole lot better. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say. Is as I was preparing my my uh, my, my class outline for this coming November for Art of the Carolinas. That was one of the things that came up. You know, y'all, break down, get over it. You, if you don't care about painting, that's all right. Then you don't have to do anything I'm saying. You get by without Photoshop. Next question, what do you do with Photoshop? Well, scores of things. I just gave you one, I put this inserted this sky into that photograph. That's just one silly little one. That's what brought up. One of the functions in my, um, hello, Barbara, good to hear you. <laughs> there, it's, that's, that's, that's a new issue, not an old one. Um, Barbara, good to see you, my dear. I'm glad you missed me the other night. <laughs> I already apologize for for some of my <laughs> wandering <laughs> wanderings the other night. You don't have to go back and listen if you haven't already. That's all I'm going to say about that. Anyway, good to have you back. I have been good to have me back, huh? <laughs> Isn't it good to have me back? <laughs> 
Oh boy, what a week. Uh, no, what a month it was. Um, in my three and a half years of, of daily art adventures, I've never had a break anywhere near that long. I, I almost didn't do any broadcasting for three weeks. Wow. And it, nothing serious, nothing, it was a whole bunch of little things. Just m mostly that I was doing a mural uh, job on location, not far from here. Painting on a wall of a big corporation and they did not want me broadcasting. So, what? <laughs> uh, I took the job. I had a good time. You, I can, I've posted images of it on my uh, YouTube community page, and that's all. But anyway, that was the main thing, and and they're probably going to hire me back to do one more, a little, little bit more. So, evidently, I'm going to disappear on. Got enough. I will come back and do the sky at least one more time in the final edit layer, maybe even in the broken color and so on and so forth. But the fuzz layer is done, so I can. Just a, a little bit more about Photoshop. Um, what I'm saying is, if you're at, at least semi a semi serious painter, I, I'm just saying, in my my opinion, which may only be worth you know the proverbial two cents, is you really can't get by anymore without without Photoshop. You're just shooting yourself in the foot. And uh, this is especially true if you do any portraiture or even figurative stuff, portraits. And you not uh, yeah. Mm. You've got to have so a little bit of me is dreading teaching this class in the fall, the class where I'm going to teach all the photomechanical tricks for capturing a likeness. Not all of them involve Photoshop, but several of them do. And I'm afraid that several of my students are going to give me that. But they, they won't want to, to invest in Photoshop. That's all right. You do what you want to do, folks. I'm just talking to people who want Now, again, two different sizes. Um, I don't talk about these brushes an awful lot. Um, but uh, it, as far as... Rosemary Brush Company is a is an excellent excellent, but I, I think they're out of England. Rosemary, um, I'll go out on the limb and say that uh, the Silver Brush Company is the um, best brush manufacturer in the United States. <coughs> and I'm I am not an expert on brushes, believe me. But um. I, I'm, I am a huge wrong silver silver Grand Prix girl not that that matters one bit I know except that those of us who are painters are we're a weird bunch aren't we <laughs> because we're just turns out we are more visually Acute? Can I use it, use the word that? So even something like a brush being pretty is more likely to make us pick it up and buy it than 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 not. Anyway, then so tip. I, I tell you what I do very often when I walk into my local art store. I'll buy one or two silver brush brushes, long filberts, by far my favorite, 85% of the brushes I use, bristle brushes, are filberts, and all the silver brushes are long filberts. Uh, it's called extra long filbert here. And, uh, but I'll buy uh, a couple of those, various sizes. I, I've learned the really tiny ones are really good for portraits. Duh, that's so obvious, but I'll say it anyway. All the way up to, I'm looking for a big one. Well, there, there's a big one, and again, that's an extra long. 
those, those are number eights. Anyway, so I'll buy very often, um, and of course, not, we're not talking about, on the other hand, the, my long handled, which I also like, another subject. <coughs> I'm talking here about ordinary length. But anyway, I'll typically buy two of these because they're quite expensive. And I'll buy a package, for what it's worth, of Pro Stroke. Now, I think this is Seymour, Hobby Lobby, and Michaels. I'm not, we don't have a Dick Blick or a, or a Utrecht around here. They're good art supply stores. But they probably all have their own, their own cheap in-house brand. That's what dollars or something. <laughs> I look at it, pack, six brushes for 10 bucks <laughs> or even 12, I don't know, and think, dang, that's $2 a brush. It's got to be a pretty terrible brush to not be worth two bucks. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I ain't proud. That's one thing I'll say about my brush buying habits. Um, so I typically and and I typically fine. They they work. They don't. You know, I don't get the same mileage out that I do, and they don't have the same beautiful point that the uh, silver brush does. But you don't always need that beautiful point. So anyway. I, I use cheap brushes and good brushes, as you probably, my fa in fact, okay, when it comes to my two favorite brushes in the world is a, the chip brush, right, which I use, as you know, and then the Winsor Newton Series 7 watercolor brush. So there you go, the cheapest brush in the world and the most expensive. These are somewhere in between. <laughs> if you ask me what my favorite brush is, I would have to say, uh, in what category are we talking here? Because I have different different favorites depending on the category. Um, this part of the painting down here, I'm still, I'm still in the fuzz, in the fuzz layer. This photograph from which I'm painting is, uh, obviously a, as I said, a, a, a professional photograph and it's time is car headlights and taillights dragged out, you know, the way a, the way a time lapse does. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful photograph. I can, I certainly understand why my client said, hey, can you do a painting like this? Um, and once again, I've already, I've already taken that photograph and tweaked it to a moderate degree in Photoshop. And so the, the photo that I'm copying up there is not a direct copy of the original. It's my, it's my Photoshop variation and I am right now for instance trying to fairly faithfully capture uh, you can see light medium dark <coughs> but uh, not wasting that time I'm, I'm going ahead and Trying to capture some of that. So right now I've got purple. I have been for the last 10 minutes in this. I'm still in the fuzz layer. For instance, and uh, that right now, but way too faint so um, I'm going to make that correction I, it was such a uh, glorious day shall we say when I broad brush broad stroke fast messy painting like what I call the fuzz you know all of that is fuzz layer when I discovered that this was the time to make color corrections. 
Um, I used to, back in the day, before I discovered this, I used to have to do color corrections in the final edit layer, which is light, opaque, a much slower, slower painting process. And making color corrections in that stage, that's a side. Hey, Uncle, bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Bless you, bless you. <laughs> that is great. You know what? I will actually, I will literally use that. I'll tell the kids. We will take them out for ice cream. That's me and the, my wife being the typical grandparents. <laughs> it's our job to spoil them. We, one of our favorite things is to take them to Good Berries, our favorite, our local. Uh, it gave us the gift of Good Berries. <laughs> Thank you. All right, my, uh, this area down here is too dark, and it, I want some green in it. Now, again, I, I just want to be clear. Why do I want green in there? Well, because I've, I've got a sketch here that I'm going by. I don't have to do, I don't have to do green because it's here. You understand? That's not the way an artist thinks. fact that it's there, but the fact that it looks good makes me go, ooh, yeah. So here's... Go around the corner of the painting here. Green. And of course, I'll, I will, in the final edit layer, I will come in and do some more of that. But that is so much quicker than, than the old... Making color corrections in the fuzz layer in this manner is so much, has sped up my painting process so much. Same thing now here. Uh, again, looking at the photograph, there's a little bit of spring green. I think this got that very, very, very pale yellow green leaves. But of course, they're all very much in the shade. So it's spring green in the shade, in the dark, right? And I'm not. You don't have to do everything that's in a photograph, of course. You should do the things that look good. <laughs> so there you go. I've already got that fixed. A fairly early journey painter, my favorite term. For yes, Barbara, I did post photos. The thing that, that, that could, should be most instructive, follow my lead and learn to paint with two hands. The effort, in my opinion. Um, but besides that, the, just the, the, all of this goes under the, this is all fuzz layer. One of the say that, but not then actually watch me do it, they would probably have a very erroneous concept. My blue that I just put covers an area this big, even though the roof is only that big. That's what I call, me myself, that's what I call, and then I'm letting on, if, if you will, Pretty serious, um, you know, visual uh, concepts behind why am I painting so mad myself to, I can't talk about everything every time. I, well, if I tried to explain everything, all, every painting. Anyway, so, but I just leave it at that. If you're a if you're a young painter or an early early in your painting journey, be instructive for you. The messiness. Uh, almost everybody says, "I wish I could paint looser." 
And then I say, well, why don't you then? <laughs> and, and what you see me doing is, uh, until it comes to portraits, then, oh, then I have to eat all these words, don't I? Shipping out. Um, I am quite happy with this portrait. How close can I get? There's an old friend of the family, Darcy. She's been married 20 years now, by the way. This is a 20-year anniversary gift from her parents. So, And there's Jay. So, um... Okay, so that's, and here's the size. Okay, so a little bit bigger than my thumb. Um, so all this talk about messiness kind of goes out the window, as you well know, when I, when I start painting uh, a portrait that size. Okay, I've still got a little bit of blue on my brushes, and I'm just looking for any place else in the painting that is crying out for a little blue fuzz. All right, I think I'm done with the blue. Now I'm going to start zeroing in really on the, not shifting color anymore, but um, really doing some of the, uh, the glow that is, I mean, as you, as you can already see, the, 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 the glowing of the street lights and so on and so forth in this scene is really a huge part of the charm of the, of the scene, of the image. The most important aspect of any painting is the play of light, right? And uh, once again, I, I have already um, worked. I've already, this is my sketch, a Photoshop sketch from a photograph, of course. And I've already worked on the, on the photograph in Photoshop to create the glow, the aura, the play of light that I want. Okay, so that's why I am now free to, um, paint from that photograph because it, it's my go-by, it's my guide at this point. I'm looking at the photograph, trying to decide what color, what colors do I want to glow first. Here's a, a general rule of thumb, by the way. You, you, if you get to stick with me for the next 10 minutes or more, you'll see this principle. Um, let me get, like a classic example would be a candle, a lantern, headlights in a, in a cityscape, headlights and taillights, traffic lights, or the moon, or stars, or the sun, anything that's glowing. Um, real simple, let me give you a real simple procedure. Number one, you paint the last. Let me use the most obvious of those examples. Candle, candle flame. You don't want a candle flame that's got razor hard edges. At least I hope you don't. If you do, you don't understand. You paint the glow around the flame first, and then you paint the flame second. Why? Because if you go to the other way around, if you paint the sharp edge of the flame first, then when you do the glow, you have to stick out your tongue in. You don't want to mess up that sharp edge of the flame. Do you follow me? So you do the, make the mess first, the glow, and then paint the flame in the middle of it. Same thing with traffic lights, headlights, tail lights, street lights, stars, fireflies, moon, sun, you name it. Reflection off a bumper if you're doing an automotive painting.
and I now I'm doing again look looking at my photograph you know to, to a surprising degree I would say not slavishly copying it but looking at each um, element in this case things that are, are uh, warm yellow orange and glowing glowing warm yellow orange that's what I'm looking at in the painting deciding if does that look good if I decide yes then I go okay then I reflect it then I then I indicate it and I render it glow about them if you will again soft edges right Um, I'll say the, the opposite of the way I usually say it. Uh, nearly impossible for a painting to have too many hard edges. No, sorry. <laughs> I, say, I, say, I messed myself up by going backwards. Nearly impossible for a painting to have too many soft edges, right? Very easy. That is to say, a default mistake that most, I think most painters, I'll say early journey painters make, a default setting that is off in their mind is too many hard edges. Now I'm really, really, it's, it's one, this is one of the things I, one of the mantras that I repeat the most and I wonder how come I'm so passionate about it. Can you imagine? Can you take a guess? <laughs> Why is Dan Nelson so emphatic about this hard, soft edge thing? <laughs> okay, the answer is, because doggone it, I, I did it wrong for so many years. I, I, and probably still do. It's one of my besetting sins. <laughs> How about that? <coughs> it is one of my default mistakes that I, I uh, allow my finished paintings to have too many hard edges, not enough soft edges. So I might be the only cuckoo nut in the world who needs to do a distinct, dedicated uh, fuzz layer. I might be this, and the guy, I don't know anybody else that does it. That doesn't mean there aren't others. But I've never heard anybody teach it, and maybe that's because I'm the only one that's this bad. <laughs> it is possible. Be that as it may, I'm teaching you what I know, and what I know is <laughs> what I know. I can't teach you what other people know. And uh, but I, I, now that I, now that I've gotten way better at this, I don't make this mistake nearly as much as I used to. Now I look at other people's paintings and I go, ooh, they need to learn this. So I've discovered that many other people do in fact habitually, who put the bitch in habitually anyway? <laughs> many other people do habitually um, leave too many hard edges in there in their paintings. I'm, I am not the only one who does that, but maybe I'm the, the worst. That's why I have to do a dedicated fuzz layer. Now, the challenge throughout the rest of the painting process, especially the, the, uh, my, um, my um, final edit layer, the challenge there will be don't, don't cover up too much don't cover up too much of this I'm doing now a, a more intense uh, deeper orange at the moment and I'm, I'm getting very close to very close to finishing the, um, I don't know if you can tell that, you know, remember what it looked like many minutes ago.
but it's a distinctly softer painting. Much, 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 much softer. And I would contend much better painting now than it was, whatever, 25 minutes ago when I started the fuzz layer. Uh, I, did, I just discovered that, that I need to go back to a uh, things, bits here and there that need to be um, yeah, pale or yellow in, in, the, in the fuzz realm. This building right here is a lovely, lovely glow coming up off it. without getting overly analytical this this mid-range area right in here has low low buildings and trees and uh, I'm not trying I'm not trying to copy them on a one-to-one -one, trying to give the impression correct or close to correct and actually, I would probably, I'll probably err slightly on the side of a few too many street lights. Again, just to get aura. A little bit of. I've got a dioxazine violet on my palette, but this is not that. This is expensive pigments. <laughs> Every once in a while, I will um, splurge and buy. As I understand it, technically purple is a little bit redder than. Than violet. Purple is more. I'm, that's not a hill I'm willing to defend or stand on or die on or anything like that. That's just as I understand it. So somebody out there, feel free to. And who doesn't want to sound otzy? If you want to sound otzy, you're supposed to say violet, not purple. You're not supposed to use purple as a kitty name for a color. <laughs> <coughs> Again, I think that's silly, but. <laughs> silly, but a grain of truth so as to <laughs> throw my weight behind the, the opposition to otsiness. <laughs> I've, I've got purple on my brushes right now. Purple, mind you, purple. And, and so I'm just looking for excuses. Excuse. I'll come out with purple again in, in, the, uh, in the broken color state, right? That, that's several hours from now. <coughs> Sorry for the cough. Um, I'll go ahead and explain real quickly, not get the big story, but last week, it was, so you don't have to wonder. Um, Uncle, did I answer your question? The new Mevo is working fine. It's the old one that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So today is a doesn't. I understand. Hello, Sharon London. Good to hear from you. <laughs> much that <laughs> Uncle Sixty is having to wipe his screen down. <laughs> All right, here <laughs> I, I, I've got some cleanup to do over here, so let me let me move. I'll let you guys. I'm changing gears. I am finished with the fuzz layer. Yay! I don't know how many minutes that took. Is anybody anybody timing? About 30 minutes, I would think. Um, and now, the next layer in the crazy Dan Nelson way of painting, the next phase, the next layer of the process, is once again drawing either with pencils, 
which make thin, scratchy lines, as you know, or with brushes, brush, small brushes, which make not quite so thin, dark lines. So it's either brush, it's either draw with pencils, so typically it's either draw with pencils and then with brushes, or draw with brushes and then with pencils. Okay, and that this has been a, a part of my painting process for several years now. And uh, it just, I used to do this immediately after the glaze. I would do the drawing and then the fuzz, but now I'm more likely to do fuzz and then drawing. So let's get you back up looking at the right direction. Oh, so I had a colonoscopy last Thursday and I woke up after my short 20, 25 minutes in the semi-anesthesia. I mean, I was out, I don't remember a thing, of course. And I had a sharp pain in my throat, rumbling in my chest, bleeding in my throat, bleeding in my chest. <coughs> I'm sorry, not bleeding in my chest, blood running down to my chest. I had what I think was S, uh, aspiration pneumonia for about three days, four days, three days, and I'm still recovering from that. So that's why I'm coughing so much. It's, I'm not contagious, I'm just <laughs> injured. Uh, feeling much better today than I did. Each day I've gotten better, so. And I finally did get to talk with the uh, anesthesiologist today and he was helpful. He, he couldn't say for sure what had happened, but he said yes, if, if they had to swab or suck something out of my throat, that wouldn't even get into their notes, which make, makes complete sense to me that they wouldn't, you know, that'd be such a non-event, they wouldn't, they wouldn't record it in their notes. And uh, that, that's probably what happened. So in the course of swabbing, and it may be too, that, um, that, um, that I simply um, asp aspirated while I was under and got already a head start on fluids on my lungs. Anyway, enough of that. So that's why I'm coughing anyway, cause, uh, because of that procedure. Everything's fine. It's just an annoying cough. All right, drawing. So it's either, um, it's either drawing with pencils. And again, in case anybody new is watching, the pencil in question is made by Jerry's Art or made for Jerry's Artorama in Austria. I understand, called Jumbo Jet Black, and it's the the pencil itself is sort of. Uh, not as greasy as a grease pencil, but more oily or waxy. Waxy would be the most accurate term. More waxy than a Conti crayon, which is a brand, of course. Any art students, you know what a Conti crayon is. So whatever it is, um, again, I started using several years ago. I really enjoy them. They play very well with both water and oil. They behave dif differently you know, with when in wet acrylics, they 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 melt a little bit, slurp around. <laughs> um, but they play well with both oil and acrylics, and it is. And, and again, if you're a new viewer, this is not conventional oil painting. It is not ordinary to draw lines to draw in an oil painting. Okay, I, I'm not trying to be ordinary. Um, I like the look, so that's why I do it. You're more than welcome to give it a give it a whirl if you want. All right, so I'm either now I'm either going to draw with small brushes, like here's a silver Grand Prix uh, long filbert number one and number two. So that's you know pretty small brushes to draw skinny lines or pencils, and usually, I've already used the pencils twice, in, I think, yeah, twice in this painting, in the acrylics layer. My general rule of thumb is, if there's still a lot of pencil showing, then I'll do the brushes first. If there's not much pencil showing, then I'll do typically, and, or whatever the heck mood I'm in. <laughs> whether it's consistent or not. And the answer is, that the answer is, da -da 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 -da. 
today it is it is uh, pencil first. So I'm going to draw with pencils, and this will take quite a while. Um, I'll, I'll do a little bit so you can, especially those of you perhaps who haven't seen me do this or haven't seen me do it often. The first thing I would like you to notice is sort of the, the, by the way that I'm moving, you can easily ascertain that uh, accurate detail capturing of the of the object or objects is not my primary goal okay I it, it goes without saying that using a skinny little black pencil using a pencil obviously is a drawing function right I'm, I'm calling it drawing and drawing sort of automatically, in most of our minds, put you into the, into the realm of careful uh, capturing, rendering, realism. It's more on the realism end of the spectrum than the abstract end of the spectrum. I, am I making sense? When you think of drawing in conjunction with painting, the act of drawing is generally construed as that which gives realism to your your painting, right? All right, correct. But you will notice by the way that I'm handling the pencils, by the way that I'm moving, the fact that I'm using, of course, my left hand, which is very definitely my non-dominant hand, and then I'm making, I'll make crazy abs, completely abstract. It, it should be obvious that um, capturing accurate Drawing accurately is my, is a secondary concern, okay? Creating uh, interesting texture quite significantly trumps. And this, I've got a pencil here that is not working very well. Just a second. I wonder if it's got some dried acrylic on the end of it. Let me sharpen it a little bit more. All right, so does that make sense? Let me say that again. Even though one would normally think of pencils as being primarily uh, useful for achieving realistic uh, rendering, um, you will discern that, in my case, that is a concern, but it's a secondary concern. In my, I'm more concerned about creating interesting marks, which is my most common description of um, I started using pencils again several years ago. The best way to describe it is I just, I like the way it looks. And let me zoom in here. Whoops, we're, I'm, I'm about to lose you guys. So let's plug, plug the power back in. Hang on. Um, I'll zoom in here. Just before I end this broadcast so you can see, there we go. Um, in a word, I like the way, I just like the way the scratchy, skinny pencil lines look juxtaposed next to the smushy paint. Smushy paint, scratchy pencil, that's what I like, okay? So that, that's why I do what I do. Now, some of you will be saying, wait a minute, you just got done talking about, you just got done talking about how it's so important not to have too many hard edges. <laughs> and yes, thanks for paying attention. Because right now, what am I doing now? I'm doing, in a way, hyper hard edges, right? Little scratchy little lines, right? So therefore, I, I, um, I, I keep that balance in mind the entire time. This is, and when I'm finished this layer, the painting's not done, and the next couple layers will serve to uh, soften much of this pencil because it'll get covered up with the final edit layer. Okay, but yes, I'm will be keenly conscious, I hope, of that hard soft dichotomy, that hard soft tension 
throughout the entire painting process and I am very aware that while I am doing pencils, uh, I am indeed um, creating hard edges. So, all right, that's I think that's probably enough. I'm going to end this broadcast here. Thank you for your company. If I find myself doing anything really fun or exciting, <laughs> I will start another broadcast uh, later today. I don't, that's, I don't know whether that will happen or not. I do, happy to say I've got a number of other little commissions uh, in the pipeline, uh, some watercolor, some pen and ink watercolor, and um, so I may do a broadcast of one of those just to give a little variety in between this, this cityscape. It is nice to be doing a cityscape again. My goodness, it's been a while. This is generally my, my stock in trade is cityscapes. And I've spent most of coronavirus season, as, as you may know, doing, uh, whoops, I went off screen there for a second, didn't I? Sorry about that. I spent most of the coronavirus season doing um, portraits, which has been absolutely delightful. But I'm open to shifting my career in that direction, if that seems the expedient thing to do, but I'm far from convinced. Far from convinced that I should abandon my my stock in trade. My all right. So you you're you're getting a realistic impression of uh, how I handle this step of the process. This drawing with pencils and making crazy abstract marks every once in a while. All right. Thanks so much for watching. I think I've got. I think I thank you, Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't nearly as scared going in as I was coming out. <laughs> Next time I'll be more scared. Something wrong with that, isn't there? <laughs> anyway, I'm glad to be well and on the mend. Thank you guys for watching. I appreciate it very much. Thanks again, Uncle, for the ice cream money. Me and the grandkids will enjoy that.